Dr. McCracken, I know there are on file a great many documents about the uh, starting of the co uh, Sarah Lawrence College, but what we need, I think, in addition to that, is the recollections, the personal recollections of some of the people that had to do directly with the founding, so that when the time comes uh, to write a history of Sarah Lawrence, uh, we will have a much more vivid and complete picture than we would have simply from the files alone. And therefore, I'm going to bother you today to give me some recollections of yours about this. And I want to add that I don't know of any other acting president of a college who, while he was acting president, without neglecting his duties in that respect, actually founded another college and t took a tremendously active interest in it for as many years as you did. Well, I'm very happy to join with you in this enterprise, Miss Warren. I believe in putting things into records, but I just want to introduce a disclaimer on my own part in it. Uh, it so happens that I've belonged to or helped to start a good many different organizations, and the only way in which I could leave one organization and enter upon another uh, in, and keep the goodwill of everybody concerned was the principle that when I resigned, I resigned. And that meant that I cut off all relationships of an official character with the organization I had left, and I banished it also from my mind in order that I could give myself completely to new enterprises. And for that reason, my memory of the past uh, is obscured by this resolution and the great many things that I probably shan't remember. So you'll have to bear with me if I don't. I have brought a few documents, a few carbon copies of letters that I wrote from time to time, uh, which will uh, bring back yes. the memory in which I can quote, perhaps. Yes, do quote anything that you feel like. Well, first of all, couldn't you give me the story of how you uh, came to know Mr. Lawrence and how you came to know him in connection with the founding of the college? Well, here I have a letter which was written to you, as it happens, on December 2nd, 1929. And that goes back, you see, pretty yes. closely to the beginning of your interest yes. in it. And I write, the earliest correspondence in my file goes back to July 30th, 1924. In November of that year, Mr. Lawrence got his lawyer, Mr. Frederick Geller, of Geller, Rolston, and Blank, of 22 William Street. And uh, he had correspondence for some time with him. And in my letter of November 25th of that year, I, I recommended this lawyer to study the catalogues of Bradford College, Packer Institute, and Stevens College at Columbia, Missouri. Mm -hmm. I had visited all those institutions at that time. This, I believe, precedes any correspondence of uh, Mr. Lawrence with Miss Coates and was the earliest uh, consultation that he had with any educational person. Well, now, how did he happen to consult you? Well, the story of that goes back still further. In uh, November 15 and 16, the alumni of Vassar College and myself raised a million dollars as a 50th anniversary fund. And at that time, uh, Mr. Lawrence's daughter, Mrs. Meggs, uh, Louise Meggs, I think yes. her name was, uh, was president, I think, of the Alumni Association, either then or mm -hmm. shortly after. Mm -hmm. At any rate, she was a very active alumna. Mm -hmm. And I met with her frequently to discuss mm -hmm. uh, our plans. Mm -hmm. And I actually met her father, and uh, seeing that he was a gentleman of some means, he had a yes. rather handsome home in New York, I think on Fifth Avenue or near it, uh, I marked him down in my mind's eye. As a college president As does. a college president inevitably does. And I visited him and I asked him for funds for this college of which his daughter was so yes. prominent a graduate. Yes. And he'd said, no, I have made up my mind to do something. I don't know what. But whatever I do, 
I shall leave at Bronxville where I made the money. I believe in yeah. leaving the money where I made it yeah. and not putting it into something else. He said, that's only fair. Mm -hmm. And at that I left it. And uh, I did not see him again that I recall, although I do remember uh, an evening's dinner party, very pleasant with Mrs. McCracken and Mrs. Lawrence, and we went off to the Philharmonic. There's an old story, and I have no idea how true it is, that uh, Nicholas Murray Butler heard that he had money and came racing out to Bronxville to get him to contribute to Columbia, and he was so furious at... Uh, his interference that he turned right around and hunted you up. Have you ever heard that story? Oh, I know all about that, oh, but that do. happened long after. That, oh, it did? Oh, yes. Uh -huh. Mr. Mr. Butler threatened Mr. Lawrence. He what? said, you can't start a college in the New York area unless it's with my consent, and I don't consent. Well, now, that's the kind of thing and I, I want to I am going to put an end to Sarah Lawrence College. It was already oh. announced then, and that was the first Mr. Butler had heard of it. Oh, and he invited Mr. Lawrence to give the college to Columbia as a junior college of Columbia, and he told him that he would give uh, the new college the same relationship to Columbia that Barnard College enjoyed. Really? Yes. I didn't know that. And this frightened Mr. Lawrence so much yes. that that was what led to his request for an affiliation with Vassar College in self-protection. And it is true, is it not, that he said if this college fails, the money goes to Vassa. Isn't that right? I never heard that. Well, I, I, I'll tell you about that. No, I, I, he never told me that, and yeah. I never heard that. But he, the first suggestion of Vassa's connection as an official relationship came from Mr. Lawrence and was due to Mr. Butler's visit. <laughs> not only Mr. Butler, but Miss Gildersleeve. Really? Oh, yes, she called on Mr. Lawrence also. And this simply terrified the gentleman, as you can imagine. Well, I think perhaps not so much terrified as made him furious, because as, as I picture him from what I hear, he was a man of very strong, independent principles, and he didn't mean to have anybody. Yes, but he was him. an old man then, yes. and he was ailing, yes. and he was letting go of his money I and see. his things. Mm -hmm. And as he says in one of the letters here to me, I feel like a captain that has launched a ship without either sails, masts, or rudder. Now you must provide these for me. You know, in uh, reading over some of the old, uh, an older manuscript that he wrote himself of his recollections, which I think has never been published, uh, I got the idea that he was a man who liked adventure. Oh yes. Very much. Oh yes, he and did. That your, uh, that your he would be far more stimulated by the fact that you wanted to uh, do something a little new and different oh, yes. than anything else. Yes, he showed that in his business, of course. He took yes, hazards. Yes, in his business. He, he made himself land poor to accumulate land when it wasn't worth anything, and he profited by it when it became worth something. And he was the pioneer. But he took risks with his fund, yes. as he did in his other businesses. Yes. He pioneered, I think, in uh, building apartment houses in suburbs, the first man who ever did it. Yes, well, he was certainly one of the first, uh, yes. uh, if not I the first. That. Well, I remember very well. Now tell me about going down and uh, seeing him about this. Well, sometime in 1926, I think it was, or it may be 19, no, yes, 1926. Uh, oh, yes, 1924. I, I wrote this letter, and uh, I wrote Mr. Lawrence in March of 1925, and we exchanged letters for some time mm -hmm. uh, in which I tried to discourage his idea, first of a boys' school. Yes. And I remember writing him a letter in which I told him that there were almost too many boys boarding schools yes. now that mm -hmm. they were competing heavily with each other, yes. uh, whereas women uh, had no such mm -hmm. uh, opportunity and most of them were crowded. And so he started with the idea, uh, I proposed the idea of a junior college, mm -hmm. uh, which might be attached to the school. Not that I believed in that, but mm -hmm. that it was a way yes. of reaching him in his present stage of thinking. Yes. And he liked that idea. And then as the correspondence went on, I tried to wean him of the idea of having a school at all and, and going in wholeheartedly for the full two years. He was a complete novice in the 
notion in knowledge of the conditions in education at the time, and he had to learn what a junior college was. Am I not right in saying that this was the first junior college in this region, this part of the country? Yes. Yes, it was. It was the first of which the regions gave a charter. Yes. The uh, uh, Packer Institute was in the nature of a junior yes. college, and it long existed. Yes. And there were other schools that gave courses to graduates. Mm. But uh, if you think of a junior college as something actually legally chartered, mm. this was, I believe, the first yes. granted by the regions. Yes. Now, of course, community college has captured the whole state, as you yes. know. Yes. Well, now, then, uh, then... Tell me how you happened to to uh, uh, to develop these ideas about the the uh, at that time unique plan for a junior college. Well, progressive education was in the yes. air. Mm -hmm. I don't remember just when the progressive education was organized, but uh, it was shortly after this, I think. But I was in touch with Mrs. Queen Ferry Coonley of yes. Chicago, yes. who uh, I think was the first president of that organization, mm -hmm. and uh, who was one of the givers of the alumni house at Vassar yes. College. And I believe that the organization meeting of the Progressive Education Association of America was held at Vassar College. It was? Yes, oh. and I attended it. And, uh, I was very much interested in that. I also was a reader of John Dewey and his mm -hmm. philosophy. Mm -hmm. I attended his lectures. I invited him to lecture at Vassar mm -hmm. College, which he did. Mm -hmm. I was very sorry to have to refuse his daughter's admission because he, like a good professor, had forgotten to register her in oh. time, and I couldn't make any exceptions. But Mr. Dewey was very friendly with Vassar College, mm -hmm. and his uh, beliefs were shared up yes. here. Mm -hmm. Miss Wiley on the faculty was a very progressive woman. And oh, she, she was an outstanding she teacher She started an educational product, mm -hmm. pro project. Miss Buck, her great mm -hmm. friend, was one of the first to introduce the participation by the student and the control of the classroom and all of that. And they had a profound effect upon them. Yes, in yes, my very, very great yes. effect. Very great I effect. had both of them as teachers. I used to smile at it once in a while because it so happened that in spite of Miss Buck's uh, granting to the students complete freedom and their choice of studies, it so happened that each freshman class every year uh, voted unanimously uh, to study Walter Peter. <laughs> now that was not uh, too natural a choice, you that know, sounds for a, little bit a, like a, a group of freshmen, <laughs> and I suspected <laughs> a hand uh, guiding the <laughs> yes. votes as. Miss Buck said, uh, indirectly, yes. you know. Well, now tell me uh, what plan you worked out with Mr. Lawrence that he... Well, liked. I had been, I think, uh, at this time, uh, a member of a conference on progressive education that was held at uh, Bradford Academy yes. in Fay Haverhill, mm -hmm. uh, Massachusetts. And Miss Coates was the head then, and she was considering the establishment of a, of a junior college. And uh, what we were discussing up there was what should a junior college consist of. Mm -hmm. My recollection is that I presented a fairly complete idea of its organization, its studies, its aims, and uh, the methods by which those aims could be, to some extent, attained. And it, it interested uh, Ms. Coates and uh, the others there. Do I, you? at that time, also was very much worried by the huge advance registration at Vassar College. Mm -hmm. We had a plan which existed before I came in 1915 by which the college registered twice as many students as it expected would come. This was the result of experience because we had found that one half of those who registered originally actually came. So we decided on that number. And then when that number was reached, we closed it. Now the effect of that was this, that in 1923, the year before I got into touch with Mr. Lawrence's lawyer at his request, Vassar College had closed its registration for eight years ahead. Mercy. And this means that the students who were to come to Vassar College were in their seventh grade in elementary school. 
And what could they know about college at all? Well, and you also at that time, I'm, I, I think, took in the daughters of, of uh, old FASA graduates. Not if they didn't register. Well, after they'd registered, but whether they were really very good or not. <laughs> I'll tell you this story. I can remember the results <laughs> from my own class. <laughs> So anxious were the ladies of certain families to register at Vassar College mm -hmm. that when the lady who is now on the board of trustees, Mrs. Catherine Blodgett Hadley, was born, uh, no, I beg your pardon, no, when her first child was born, her first daughter, uh, her mother-in-law, Mrs. Hadley, the wife of the president of Yale at the mm -hmm. time, made the trip from New Haven to Poughkeepsie to register her on the day she was born, only to find that Mrs. Hadley's own mother, Mrs. Blodgett, also a graduate of the college, oh, had oh. registered her by telegraph from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Well, that sounds like the way they registered in Oxford and Cambridge. Well, it's it? something like that, <laughs> I assure you. But it had to be stopped. Yes. And I obtained first a, a, a so-called honor list of 10 students, which I could grant, that's the way the trustees would put it, no other way. Mm -hmm. I handed it over to a faculty committee. Mm -hmm. uh, then it was in re enlarged to 25, then to 100, and finally the whole class became a competitive basis, yes. you see. Mm -hmm. Now, I still was concerned with the responsibility of Vassar College for women's education in general, that, that if we were a closed corporation as we were, we were still under obligation to help others. Mm -hmm. I therefore assisted in the organization of the Women's College in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Oh, I didn't know Oh, that. yes, I was. Yes. Uh, I worked in close yes. touch for yes. months with the yes. Women's Committee mm -hmm. of the General Federation of Women's Clubs, which, organ which produced the, the college finally. And this was uh, one of these opportunities. There were yes. others. Mm -hmm. And so when I saw an opportunity, to, it never occurred to me that he would want me to continue. Mm -hmm. I did. Uh, write out and, and propose these things uh, in order that more women could have an opportunity of the best education. Well, now, do you think that was the first time Miss Coates had uh, heard of this type of education, or do you think she'd gone to one of those uh, uh, those educational meetings that preceded the founding of Bennington. Oh, I think I think she had gone. Yes. And I think her ideas were pretty well formed yes. of of what she wanted. Yes. I think she was uh, in agreement with what I uh, said, and I don't know that I added anything, but mm -hmm. certainly the the other people who were there, the general audience, were rather surprised by yes. the. Uh, plans I had. Did you have any trouble, any great trouble, persuading Mr. Lawrence to sh shift over from the education of boys to girls? No. 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 And I'm pretty sure that when he shifted over, he was uh, he was excited to think he was going to have something to yes. do with a pioneering kind of education. Yes. He had quite a number of granddaughters. And he yes. was interested in That's that. That's true, he did. But he was greatly interested in his wife devoted to her, yes. and he wanted to do something in, in her memory. memory as well, you know. Yes. And it, as it finally came out, it was solely in her memory that he yes. acted. Yes. Well, now go ahead from, from that and tell me how, um, uh, what was the next step after he decided that he wanted to do this? Well, my recollection is, and I may be mistaken in this, that uh, he wrote me asking for names of persons who might head the organization, yes. and that I wrote him a letter uh, in which I mentioned your name and Ms. Coates's name and a third person. I don't have a copy of that letter. It may be on file in Sarah Lawrence I don't College, know. or I it may not. Yes. But I, I have this recollection, mm -hmm. and that uh, I mentioned uh, that I had been at this conference at Bradford. Uh, I don't see camp. how you got hold of my name. I? Yes. Oh, I, I, knew you, I knew you very well. I, I'd been up at Pine Manor and... and uh, I'd forgotten Oh, that. yes. Oh, yes. Of course, I and knew I'd Dr. Been Taylor up there. very well. I, I'd visited most of the schools. And yes. I, I, yeah. We had a large number of graduates in Boston. Yes. And it was a very active branch. And Miss mm -hmm. Cushing knew all about you. Mm -hmm. She was my great friend at the time. Yes. And uh, uh, we... Marion uh, Coates was, um, I think, two classes below me in college. I knew her, not, yes. not well, but I'd known her, I'd known her out in uh, Chicago when she was out yes. there. 
I went out to see if I wanted to take over a, a school out there and decided I didn't want to. Yes. She did. Well, then go ahead. <laughs> well, I have here a quotation from her letter to me of August 20th, 1926. She was invited by Mr. Lawrence to spend a week down there yes. and to talk with him about it. The week in Bronxville, she says, was certainly an interesting one. We prepared a statement for the Board of Regents, a copy of which was probably sent you. Judge Gilbert approves it. Now asks for a conference with members of the board in advance of the meeting. Mr. Lawrence is trying to arrange for this conference. You see, that, that begins the setting up of it. If you're in Poughkeepsie at that time, I'll plan to come down to Alumni House for a day or so and greatly appreciate the opportunity of going over matters connected with the founding of the college and its organization with you. Our second piece of work was a composition of Mr. Lawrence's letter to the first board of trustees. Well, then you had a board of trustees by that time. Yes. It, well, it now, is, how did you started. select them? Well, uh, Mr. Dudley Lawrence didn't come in until a little bit later, mm -hmm. and Mr. Lawrence made the incomplete se uh, selection, as yes. I recall. Mm -hmm. uh, now, who is this Mr. Gilbert? for whom a dormitory is named, who's always been a myth to me. I've never known anything about him, except that he was an Albany lawyer. Am I right about that? Yes. And that he got the charter through. Yes. Uh, yes. Did he take an active part in any other way? No, not a, not a very active you part. You see, I come from Albany, and I never heard of him up there. He was yes. after my day. Yes. He was a very courteous uh, yes. and a very competent man. Yes. He was a good, old, a good deal older than I, in my recollection. Uh -huh. He was perhaps not of Mr. Lawrence's age, but pretty nearly yes. uh, that. Uh, but he was skilled, and Mr. Lawrence had great confidence in him and his ability to get things through. How did you, uh, how, d uh, 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 how did you decide about having some of the Vassar trustees on the Sarah Lawrence Board of Trustees? Did they volunteer to do that? Did you ask them to, or what happened? Uh, what happened was that shortly after the announcement of the college, uh, its organization, uh, which was, I think, in 1927, the, when it was made, announced. Well, it, no, it was all, it was got its charter in 26. I know it did. Well, yes, I guess perhaps the first, uh, the first announcement came as a result of the charter, because that was a public yes. hearing and all mm -hmm. that. Uh, I was asked what kind of a college it would be and gave a, an interview in which uh, the, to the, uh, press? the reporter, yes, the reporters at once jumped to the fact that it would be a charm school. Yes. And I believe the phrase charm school arose at that time. <laughs> well, now here's something that I remember you're saying to me, that one of the things that distressed you, and this was aside from the fact that you couldn't take anything like all the girls who wanted to come, the fact that a great many girls who went to, uh, here to college, uh, for one reason and another, were only going to be here a, a year or two. That's right. They were getting married or something of that sort. And uh, they, their first two years were pretty well mapped out for them, so that when they left, they had never had a chance to plunge into the material they really that were true, interested yeah. in. Yes. Now, hadn't that something to do with your plan oh, yes. for the new? Oh, yes, well, tell it us did. about that. Well, I had been out west, and I had seen junior colleges. There yes. were none in the east mm -hmm. that I knew of, except, mm -hmm. um, well, Miss Coach was planning one, yes. and Packer Institute had done something of this kind. Uh, but it seemed to me that they felt a, a, a real need, and I thought that if California could have as many as she mm -hmm. could with her mm -hmm. big universities and mm -hmm. its branches and all that, and private colleges as well, New York, with its much larger population, uh, needed something of the kind, and that jived in with my own experience in me. And the universities in New York didn't need to kill this. No. <laughs> no. No. The, uh, the educational theory in New York was a pretty cut and dried one at that time, pretty mm -hmm. traditional, mm -hmm. and uh, it governed the report, and the Board of Regents was a conservative organization, it always has been. Yes. I think on the whole, its effect has been good in, in education for that mm -hmm. very reason, because mm -hmm. we have maintained standards that other yes. states tried to come up to. But when it came to innovation, mm -hmm. uh, there wasn't a place for it, you see. Well, Mr. I, Dewey was here, but he went to Chicago. The other people did the yeah. same thing. I want to say this, that in my recollection of my, of, of my 
uh, relations with them. For instance, when we when we um, asked for a four-year charter, they had rather rigid requirements for an AB degree, and they sent people down to Sarah Lounge to examine it, and they said, we are so thankful there is a college that is experimenting on a sound level that we will scrap all our requirements for you except that they must have had so many hours, so many uh, points to enter, yes. you see. Yes. And certain of those points, I believe, had to be in English. That was the only requirement that they made. Yes. They gave us a perfectly free hand. Yes, I think there was always a uh, minority who felt well, that way, I think that but I'm not sure that it was, yes. well, it was perhaps about that time that they began to swing around, but well, you know I how long it was before they opened the junior college idea to the whole state? I know. It was long I think, after this. I think this happened in the case of the regents and also in the case of the Middle States and Maryland Association. Yes. The caliber, yes. they came down and talked to the faculty, and the caliber of the faculty impressed them in both cases so yes. strongly that they were perfectly willing to accept a yes. queer, new <laughs> yes. college, uh, which was no charm school, yes. but was being carried on by scholars uh, in a research experimental yes. uh, Well, Miss, plan. Miss, Miss Wiley, whom I mentioned here at Vassar, yes. had taught at Packer before she came to Vassar. Oh, I didn't know that. And she brought her ideas with her yes. from that school, which yes. was a very progressive school, yes. really. and. Uh, c carried it out through the whole English department. And from there, Ms. Salmon and the history department had similar ideas on, well, on how to, to open back, up a subject. To go back, uh, tell me about this board of trustees. Uh, they, it was of immense value to Sarah Lowndes to have uh, experienced people from the, from the Vassar board. Did you have difficulty in persuading them to Not join? at all. They were delighted to serve. Mr. Lawrence made this appeal that I yes. think I mentioned and uh, the Board of Trustees uh, discussed it very fully, but uh, they were in cordial sympathy with it, and they voted to grant the request of Mr. Lawrence, which was that uh, the, a number of members of the Vassapur uh, of Trustees would be elected uh, uh, to serve on the uh, Sarah Lawrence Board at the request of the Sarah Lawrence College yes. uh, and uh, work with them and that the president was officially authorized to serve as a trustee of yes. Sarah Lawrence. Yes. That was by vote of the Vassar yes. Board of Trustees. Yes. And this, it was uh, uh, done because, partly because there were several uh, members of the board who were very much interested in progressive education. Mr. Stephen, Stephen Duggan, Duggan was, yes. was the leading one, and he became a, an active trustee on Sarah Lawrence oh, Board yes, as well. He lived not, not far away from there, much and nearer than Morris. I did. Yes. Ray Morris was the most active of the financial members of the board. He was a partner in Brown Brothers yes. uh, and Company, later Brown Brothers Harriman and Company, and uh, a leading uh, banker of New York. And he was the brother of Mrs. Hadley of Yale I University. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And his family connected with education for well, he, a long time. He was an educated yes. lawyer. <laughs> yes, his father was governor of Connecticut yes. and he was interested in schools and things. And he was a writer as well as a banker yes. and uh, a very great help to us. And there were others. Uh, Mrs. Allen was, uh, was uh, active in it, others. And uh, so uh, those four were appointed uh, and they served and worked. And when it came to the financial funding, Mr. Morris's help was a vast influence. I now have here... Explain that, will you? To well, I have a, an account here written by Mr. Dudley Lawrence, which has been published, I mm -hmm. believe. It, at any rate, it's in the files of yes. Sarah Lawrence, in uh, which he tells that uh, after planning what was the minimum we thought necessary to start with, the dormitory space and dining room and library and the rest of it, uh, we would have to borrow a half million dollars, mm. and this was a very large sum to borrow at that time. Uh, it was uh, in the rather hectic uh, weeks preceding the great crash, and there was mm. too much gambling going on, and the conservative banking institutions that really had money of that kind to lend were very careful about lending it. Somebody told me that it was the biggest uh, uh, mortgage ever taken out by a college. 
Well, I don't know. It was not know com common to... Yes. Colleges didn't have a high credit <laughs> rating in Wall Street. That's the truth. And Mr. Lawrence tells how he and I, uh, and I think uh, someone else too, Mr. Gilbert, or was it Miss Coates, went to the Bankers Trust Company and tried to interest them in this loan. We did so because the Bankers Trust Company was banker for Vassar College and oh, held yes. all its endowment funds in its vaults. And they also knew Mr. Morris well enough. But as he says in this letter, I was, it was extremely a uh, cold interview. They were just frosty. And they just put us off with a saying, well, they'd think it over and refer it to a committee. And we knew what that meant, that meant the eternal pigeonhole, you know. So we had lost. But we went to work uh, quietly, Mr. Lawrence and I, and we pulled our wires. And this uh, third member of the board, whose name I forget, I may be able to find him, who was, uh, who was with us, uh, says that uh, he thinks that uh, our names, Mr. Lawrence's and mine, <laughs> should uh, be dated for this because two weeks later, the Bear Banker Trust Company loaned us the money. Now, how would you, how'd you pull wires? Well, <laughs> <laughs> there is where my memory conveniently <laughs> slips. Oh, but yeah. I know that I had friends who were on the board. I knew Mr. Prosser, the president of yeah. the Bankers Trust Company. I went to him. Several members connected with the Bankers Trust Company had been very active with me on the Red Cross, oh, yeah. of which I was a member of the National Committee during the First World War mm -hmm. and active in various branches of it. And uh, so I... I pulled the Red Cross wires, and, uh, <laughs> and they were, what things Dudley Lawrence did, I don't know, but he had his own connections. <laughs> and then came, after the college was founded, the crash of 1929, and well, here no, we were. I was, I was only a few months there. Yes, and uh, here it went. The first thing that happened was that the Bankers Trust Company called the loan. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, right off. They demanded Ooh. it, and we had no money to pay for it. Mm -hmm. They would have... Uh, simply taken possession of Sarah Lawrence College and sold it in the market well, for the value of the real estate. Now, I'm getting something very interesting. What did you do? We talked it over together, Mr. La Mr. Lawrence and I. We canvassed all our friendships, all our past relationships that we could use, and we finally agreed on one man who we thought would be a key man. His name was Howard Bain. It happened that Dudley Lawrence and I were schoolmates oh. at Berkeley School in New York. And one of the men in school at that time was Howard Bain. He had become an investment consultant and advisor in New York, of very high repute. And he was connected with various institutions, one kind or another. Among others, I think he was a director of the Prudential Life Insurance Company. So I went to see Howard Bain, and I laid the whole project before him. The name of Mr. Morris is come to me as that of the third yes. member of the Board of Trustees who went down to the Bankers Trust Company and got that. And it was largely, I think, uh, due to his prestige as a banker that yeah. we finally got the loan uh, in the first place from the Bankers Trust Company. But he did not make the trip to Newark, which I did, to the Prudential Life Insurance Company <laughs> with that good fortune. Uh, Mr. Morris was on the board as the result of this resolution by which four members of the Vassar Board of Trustees served ex officio on the uh, board of Sarah Lawrence College. There were nine trustees there, and those four with the president of Vassar as chairman of the board constituted a majority of the board, so that uh, Sarah, uh, Vassar College could have made itself very unpleasant and absorbed the whole institution, and it was very magnanimous of it uh, not to do it. Indeed, they were quite willing to go further than their bond and agreed to a severance of the relation a few years later on, in 1932. And I have a letter giving the joint resolution of the two boards of trustees, that of Sarah Lawrence and of Vassar, by which they terminated the agreement, except in so far as the, that the president of Vassar College should continue ex officio to be a member of the Sarah Lawrence board. That ensured a continuance of his service and of other services which Vassar College could lend without expense to it. 
as, as requested. And as you remember that, don't you? Oh, very well. And I do, do remember that for a number of years, your controller came down, I think, once a month. Yes. And looked over our um, expenses, our Yes, finances. he set up the budget forms yes. and all that. He was an expert in that yes. field, Mr. Paul Cassatt. Yes. And uh, the general manager came in the same way as an uh, expert engineer and planned the whole heating plant and the water system and the electric lighting and everything of that kind had an expert engineer's uh, thing without uh, uh, anything like the cost that it would have been uh, but professionally. aside from your contribution to the college, I don't know any step which Vassar took which was more uh, significant from our point of view than the, when your uh, faculty voted to accept transfers from Sarah Lawrence College into their junior year. Yes. You see, our problem as a junior college at first, and especially because junior colleges were almost unknown in the East, was what was going to become of the girls who wished to go on to college, particularly as we had none of the usual freshman and sophomore requirements, yes. nor a marking system. Yes. And therefore, we were stymied at first by that. And then you came to our rescue and uh, your faculty voted that they would accept them and if their qualifications seemed good. And then the other colleges all fell in line. Yes. It was very interesting. And now, of course, there's uh, no question whatever about it. You might be interested to know that our tenant in our double house that we now live in here in Poughkeepsie mm -hmm. uh, is Dr. Melissa Richter. And Melissa Richter is a graduate of Sarah Lawrence College, an associate professor, I believe she is, of physiology at uh, Vassar College, having done uh, notable research work at uh, Yale. And she's a very enthusiastic uh, alumna of Sarah Lawrence College, may I say. Well, there have been certainly always the most cordial relations. Uh, I simply can't tell you how... Then, you know, we also appointed... Uh, we had another trustee after the severance of those relations, and that was Winifred Smith from your faculty. Yes. Who was a very valuable trustee. Yes. But what it meant to me as president to have the head of the board, a man who had the academic viewpoint instead of the usual banker's viewpoint of presidents of boards of trustees, you'll never know. It was enormously important because uh, every board of trustees has some bankers on it and some businessmen who can't see why you can't order your faculty to do just what you tell them to, and the faculty accept it, just as they do in business. And for, to have uh, somebody who could back you up and saying that if you're going to have faculty that amount to anything, you've got to respect their opinion <laughs> and Well, well there was them. one field in which my experience, I think, uh, was of some help to the college, and that was in the matter of faculty government and tenure and, yes. re and relationship. Uh, I have a letter here, uh, I think it's written to Mr. Lawrence, in which I describe the form of government that I suggested might be adopted, uh, and the, the faculty were to prepare the document and complete it in cooperation. Mm -hmm. And then the Board of Trustees, uh, I think it was when you came, voted to approve it Yes. and establish it with the uh, proviso, which exists in the trust, uh, Vassar system also, that they can recall it at any time. They never have, but they have that legal authority, of course, imposed on them by law. And uh, that was very helpful. It, it meant that Zero Lawrence was progressive not only in its methods of education, but in its methods of appointment and tenure and, yes, and, and responsibility for the work of the educational branch. We, we, uh, we developed that even further, I think, than, than colleges have generally gone in the question of, of, of dismissals and, and appointments. When I first came, one of the things that tempted me to go to, to Vassar was uh, the, the possibility of having some influence in an educational institution in which I could clean house and get rid of poor and mediocre faculty and have a faculty that hit on all cylinders. Yes. And that was a question that was burning with me. I'd watched children sacrifice to stupid teaching 
for so many years I couldn't stand it any longer. <laughs> so the first year, and I don't blame Miss Coates for having a very uneven faculty, she couldn't possibly choose such a big group all at once and have them all right. And also she didn't know where the college was going, how it was going to develop. There were some dreadful people on the faculty the first year and I gave them a goodbye at the end of the year. And then the next year I began on the mediocre ones that were always going to be worthy and dull. And I, I could just see vistas of children having to suffer from them. And I began on those and that frightened the faculty because they were scholars, these people, but they were just dull. And they came to me and asked if we, they could have an advisory committee. And I said they could, provided they would accept two, two provisos. One was that after all, the final authority must rest, rest with me, the final decision, because I was responsible to the trustees. But secondly, um, it was that there would never be any indication of politics being played in those appointments, and there never was. I've mm. never seen a group work so well mm. or so hard. Then I promised never to make an appointment without consulting them. And it is, it has been a democratic procedure that's rather unusual, I think. Yes. You see, not depending on departments at all. Yes. But um, yeah, the, anyway, to go back to your, to to the financing. You see, I came in just at the, at the uh, uh, two, three months, I came in, in at Thanksgiving time in 29, just <laughs> before the crash came. And we were the youngest, and uh, uh, according to the public, the most ridiculous college uh, of a charm school. And we were the most expensive, and everybody predicted we were going to collapse right off. I remember when I, I came down with you and met the board of trustees, I think it was in Stephen Duggan's office. And you, uh, the, the trustees asked me questions. One of the things they seemed very concerned about was, did I have to have a, an expensive automobile and chauffeur? <laughs> I laughed and said, no, I had an old second-hand Buick, and I always drove myself, and they seemed relieved. And then they assured me that I would have no financial responsibility. But of course, being a Yankee, I did. <laughs> And this question of forty thousand dollars a year that we had to pay for for interest and amortization, I couldn't bear to, to uh, uh, pass on to a successor. And Mrs. Swoboda was marvelous in helping uh, the controller in helping to economize, and and we economized in every little way that we. I could. wonder if you realized at the time how economically the college was planned. No, I don't well, think it I was did. A part, well, you tell it me that. It was a part of that design. You see, the property of Mr. Larches was a very charming one, but mm -hmm. it was very steep in the yeah. hillside. And if we occupied the central area, there was nothing left of the campus to speak of. So we made that pay in organization. We placed the boiler house at the bottom of the Lois building. We use the vacuum system of steam heat, which sucks the steam up the pipe oh. and allows it, when it's transferred into hot water, to flow back again by gravity and not a pump to the boiler house to be reheated into steam and, and sent again. Well, I was there 16 years and never learned that. Yes. Well, that's the most an economical way of heating a building. Isn't that? It is still. Yeah. And, uh, in fact, you you almost heat the, the buildings for, for nothing beyond, beyond the central building, that is, it's just an expansion system. You never had any trouble there with heat at all, I think. I think it was perfectly, no. from all I heard, it was perfectly, perfectly managed. Mr. Richards designed, he was the general manager of Bassett, and he designed that whole thing that way. Similarly, the, boiler, the uh, dining rooms so on were directly over the boiler house, and uh, cooking with with steam heat and so on, oh. they had their supply right there, you see, for yes. all their things, yeah. their hot water and everything else. Yeah. It was just a gravity flow. <laughs> the same thing was true of the walks and the care of the grounds. The, the students went up and down a single path, and that was all that had to be cleared, you know, if there was a snowfall or something like that. And then, the instead of building a separate classroom building with all that yeah. additional expense yeah. when it wasn't in use, yeah. we used the basements of the dormitories 
for the classrooms. Yeah. And we could do that because they were on side hills and the windows were all above ground mm -hmm. so that you would, didn't realize you were in basements. We even had a theater in the basement, as, as you recall. Oh, yes. And the, uh, the chapel was right next to the dining room, so you could mm -hmm. have a meeting and walk in to lunch without going out, out of doors. And the post office right below that. And the post office right below that. Mm -hmm. Everything was highly concentrated in an extremely economic, and yet it didn't look parsimonious because the buildings were dignified inside, and you just didn't ask a, a question. We got along without a gymnasium. We got along without athletic fields. Mm -hmm. We got along without a great deal of the incidental expense that ordinary colleges have. We didn't have to have a lot of watchmen around as, as Vassar College did. You know, um, you remember that there was a little golf course, a small yes. golf course near there? Yes. And I had thought, and belonged to the Lawrences, and wasn't very much used, and I thought of uh, asking them if they would give it to the college. And before I did that, I asked a very famous engineer, Francis Donaldson, who did the Cooley Dam, was an old friend, if he would uh, go over it with me uh, and, and see about its availability, because I knew they hadn't built on it for the reason that it was uh, boggy. And he announced that it would be enormously expensive to, um, uh, to drain it, just prohibitively expensive. Mm -hmm. And so I never did. But I've always been sorry afterwards that we didn't, because I think somehow we could have had that as a playing field. What yes. happened was it was taken by a real estate company. I understand they spent a million dollars mm. and then built big apartments on it. Yes. But I think we I, could have I just like to record the four Vassar trustees who did serve. They were, all of them, progressive uh, leaders in their own areas. Yeah. It was Ray Morris that we've already mentioned. Mm. It was Francis Fenton Park who I think was Dean of Smith College. She was, and then went to Bennington. To and, then went, and then went to Bennington, and she was very much of this uh, group of people in the field of education. And then there was Mr. Lionberger Davis. I don't of, remember him. Of St. Louis. Well, John Lionberger Davis has been a, a leader of progressive movements in St. Louis for a generation. But I think he must have gotten off about he the time did. I came. He attended, I noticed that he attended the meeting of appointment and so on. Mm -hmm. He was there, but he, because of his uh, business engagements yes. and other things, was not. But he was a man, a patron of the arts. He had a wonderful collection of... Oh, Rem his name Rem is very familiar. Rembrandt and yes. so on. And uh, always in uh, the thick of those things. So that it was rather remarkable that we were able to pick from Vassar a group who were willing and, and to interest themselves yes. uh, in this thing as much as they did. Mrs. Park was, was greatly interested. Oh, yes. Uh, learned a great deal, I think, herself. I, uh, we were in college together. She was a little ahead of me in college. Yes. Francis Fenton. Yes. Well, now, uh, supposing you tell me something about, uh, have you any other recollections of those early years when you came down before the college was started? Now, I think you had, that uh, you told me once that Mr. Lawrence planned some of the buildings, that being much in his line, and that you changed those plans. Uh, well, I, I secured the election of Mr. Dudley Lawrence. He, mm -hmm. at first, uh, well, he did wanted to keep hands off with his father, and in, in the first place, in a very natural and loyal mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. But after his father's death, he, he came mm -hmm. on the board. And uh, the truth must be said that uh, being younger, he was much more modern in his understanding mm -hmm. of buildings, and he mm -hmm. saw at once that the buildings needed uh, modification. And uh, so far as concerned, the material of which they were made, uh, the way the architecture chosen, he chose the architect, a man. Dudley? Uh, Dudley or his Dudley, father? Dudley. Well, I think the architect was the man who'd been working for the Lawrence building. That's right, that's right. He'd, he'd worked mm -hmm. in apartment house building and yes. so on and very successfully with them mm -hmm. so that they worked closely with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, he carried out uh, this modified English uh, period, which mm -hmm. is, is a very good one and, and fits into the landscape there and to the other building yes. very well. But uh, there were all kinds of economies, you know, we originated that plan of having, instead of a general bathroom in the basement or something yes. like that, which the old dormitories used to have, a uh, bathroom between each two bedrooms. Very and, deluxe. And communicate, huh? Very deluxe. Yes. Uh, uh, or the, stu the students at once thought that, you know, because mm -hmm. Vassar and Bryn Marshall, they didn't have that, you know. No. And then 
between the bathroom and the hall, a closet from each side, yes. filling up that space. So you had, that also meant a noise barrier, yes. so that when you were in your bedroom, it was closed. Uh, By see. the way, the new dormitory, uh, which, uh, for which they got a loan from the government, uh, they were not allowed to put individual bathrooms. They've got to go back to the old system. They won't lend them the money card. <laughs> Well, is it after, after, do you know it's cheaper than the other way? No. Mr. Lawrence found that in spite of the cost of the plumbing, it was the cheapest way of building it. You didn't have to have big pipes at one place, oh. and the larger pipes cost more, yeah. and so forth and so on. Well, there were lots of, uh, of, we got that right down to a, now, and in building a lot, we see, we built three dormitories at one time, I yes. think. Yes. And, uh, and in doing that, you see, we got a whole set of prices on the, you got, you on, built, on uh, bathtubs and things like that. You built Gilbert, Dudley Lawrence, and Titsworth yes. together. Yes. And when I came, they were built. Yes. And you had just built uh, the a big extension, the, uh, yes, you just built the big dining room in Bates. Yes. The first year you didn't have that and the girls ate down at, yes. uh, at Gramerton. But you, about, by the time I got there, they didn't. It was just, just two points on which you and I didn't d d agree very well in buildings. You didn't like as many windows as I did and you didn't like showers as I remember it. And I always wanted showers. <laughs> Well, I've Very come around to your point. opinion on showers. <laughs> if you had to wash your hair, I still like don't shower. like the overuse of glass in modern architecture. I think oh, I'd live in a greenhouse <laughs> if I could. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, no, this new dormitory has glass walls up and down the street side. You can you see uh, the girls scampering up the side uh, downstairs from yeah. floor to floor with practically nothing on. Yeah. And what that's going to collect <laughs> on the street? A famous architect in Detroit, who had a daughter at college, uh, told me that I, well, we ought to open up and have glass. And he said, "He said you just put glass on the street side of of uh, Vassar College, and you'll be so full and so rich you won't know it. The girls scampering up and down and all. Uh, that'll that'll bring everybody here. <laughs> all the peeping toms in the neighborhood. Yeah." <laughs> Now, uh, the, uh, uh, the, you also told me something else that interested me very much, that Mr. Lawrence originally planned to put faculty resident houses down on what we call Ferry Field. Yes. And to put uh, uh, dormitories around the, the, uh, both sides of the central campus. Yes. And it was you that uh, explained to him that to keep the sense of vista and distance you should have the dormitories all on that one side making a crescent, isn't that right? Yes, that is correct. I yes. think that was awfully and I good. think Mr. Dudley Lawrence agreed with that at the time. He did, yes. And you didn't build any residence. No, well, we few. kept that open. You had that distant view, which was very fine. Yes, and it's blocked now, you see, but this new dormitory. I, I've heard that it was. Oh, <laughs> I feel dreadfully about that. Well, they Why needed, they didn't build they on Ferry Field, I don't know. Yeah. I've always thought, you see, there was a hole in the middle of Ferry Field. Yeah. And we've been filling it up with ashes for the first yeah. few years. I thought that you could have built dormitories around that and had a beautiful swimming tank yeah. in the middle, which would have been... My father oh. on the campus at New York University used to call those pits for donors. <laughs> he'd take a donor around, he'd fall into the pit, and then he'd build a building to fill up the pit, you see. <laughs> yes. I think there was more than, more than one of that kind, as a matter of fact. Well, now, haven't you just used some more recollections you ought to give me there? Now, about the, four, uh, the reasons for the four-year charter, how did you feel about that? Did you like the, uh, the developing into a four-year college or not? I had no objection to it. It seemed to me that the evolution of it painted, uh, pointed that way, and it also seemed to me that there was the likelihood of a considerable number of junior colleges being established yes. elsewhere in the state. They had already been. Briarcliff came along and mm -hmm. others came, mm -hmm. and uh, it was beginning to be Bennett College up here in Dutchess County. And uh, so I, I didn't make any great objection to it, and I could see it because I talked with the students themselves, yeah. those who wanted to go yeah. on. Yeah. It is still true that uh, I think Sarah Launch has a disproportionate uh, number in the two lower grades. A good many do leave higher percentage than in the uh, I don't know grade. what the statistics are but, now. Uh, the, the, that is, isn't is so. That is, huh? country. Fifty percent is about the uh, the usual average in the United States. 
Yes, well, at, at Vassar, it was 85% that graduated. It was? Yes. I don't believe ours is 85. It's down to about 66 now, I think, here. Well, these, these very early marriage, marriages make a difference. Yes, it? yes, it does. Yes. Well, you may be interested in a story about the, the, uh, the uh, transition. We had a very able girl in college named Catherine Hogel from Salt Lake City and who wanted to go on from one of the very first classes. And uh, as a, and University of Chicago uh, would accept her. That's where she wanted to go. And as a matter of pride, the, the faculty uh, were very anxious that she succeed there. And they picked her faculty that she was to work with very carefully to be sure they were really able people. Got her the very best faculty they could. And the, the Easter, I found her on the campus. And I said, well, Kay, what are you doing back at college? And she said, I'm making this into a four-year college. And I said, well, what do you mean? She said, I'm going back to kindergarten at the at, uh, University of Chicago. <laughs> said, I just sit and take notes and read from page to page. She said, that's no way to treat a person in a junior year. She said, we've got to have two adult years here at this college to add to the first two adult years. And I said, well, you couldn't say anything the faculty would like better. <laughs> and the thing that intrigued us was uh, to see if you couldn't retain the freedom of the first two years yeah. and add two more years and develop scholarship as you went along without necessarily confining the students uh, to, uh, to a major. Yes. I remember that I impressed the Vassa faculty at the time that they voted to give full credit to Sarah Lawrence by showing them a catalog statement of the Stanford University, which had a list of graduates of junior colleges alongside of their own students. Yes. On the whole, the gra graduates of junior colleges in California ranked higher in the two upper years than the students who'd been there through the whole course. And this and the two Sarah Lawrence girls were at the very top of the list, pretty nearly. Really? Whereas two girls who had left Vassar and gone there had not done nearly so well, and they were in about the middle ruck yeah. of the, uh, the class. I didn't tell the faculty that they'd both been dropped from Vassar, you know, and, <laughs> and got into Stanford. But it was very impressive, <laughs> and it, it turned the trick. I wasn't obliged to tell it. <laughs> Those are little devices of the president. Well, they, as a piece, as a research project, whether you could keep that freedom in the first two years and run a substantial four-year college seemed to me very a very important piece of research uh, to do, carry Vassar on. Vassar professors did object to the fact that the quantum of factual knowledge yes. possessed by the graduate of the junior college was not as great as that of our sophomores at the, at the end. But their initiative and their willpower and their purpose uh, seem to be uh, equally, if not more, mature. Well, I think there's another factor. I think oftentimes their a capacity to organize, to find material and to organize it is as good or better. Yes. Because they've had a great deal of training in that. Yes. Uh, they, uh, I, I I've noticed in the reports of the two institutions, uh, in, but not at the present time, but say 15 years ago, the last I recall, that uh, the number of books per student taken out by the student from the library at Sarah Lawrence is considerably higher than that. Here, uh, here at Vassar, which is also considerable. But yes, it's quite extraordinary how that small library is, is used to the limit by the students there. Uh, we've got to get a new library building I don't soon. doubt it. Uh, we, I we spent are, a lot of time planning what little we had. We were, considering the money we had, I think we got a wonderful library. Well, you have, uh, library we here. had a perfectly wonderful librarian always. Yes. To think that with the fairly limited You know, there are about 500 of my books down there. <laughs> Oh, they came up here and robbed, robbed my book, uh, my library. I she, think you're. Right. I, I remember her very well. She came in and she took all the best books <laughs> I had. Well, <laughs> I had I, two first editions of Congreve, William Congreve. Oh no, she didn't take those. Yes, she did. She they're, they're down Who there. Who shouldn't have let her? If they're if they're still there. Oh they, yes, they, they One of them be. is one of them's called Love for Love. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, they, I think it's, it was phenomenal. I was there 16 years, and never once did a faculty member come to me complaining 
that they hadn't been able to get uh, to uh, yes, get the yes. books it's, it's they a, wanted. It's a that very matter. efficient, Post and I noticed remarkable. that the examiners of junior colleges commended it uh, in that regard. Well, she's written, you know. I know they took my Dictionary of National Biography, which is <laughs> quite a useful work. I've missed that quite a little. <laughs> oh, I think they should return it to you. <laughs> I want to go back to the financial end because it was rather dramatic, I think, they, they, uh, they coming the birth of a new college so soon, uh, 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 so so shortly before the crash, and I um, I wondered how much the trustees worried about that. After this, they got this permanent loan. Did they worry very badly? No, I don't think so. We were not a worrying crowd. Uh, we'd been through twenty nine, you know, yeah. and after that. Well, no, I mean twenty nine. Huh? I mean 29. Yes, you 29. came in 29. Oh, yeah. well, yes, there were sleepless nights yeah. in 29. There must have oh, been. Yes, we didn't know whether the college would open the following fall at this high price, you know. Well. Because things were so flat, it's difficult to recall now how flat well, they were. Well, I'll tell you one but thing. But you know, the, the worst depression came in 32. Yes. I, I recall very vividly the number of publicity people that were standing on the doorstep wanting to to take on the publicizing of the college in order to raise money. Just quantities of them. And I had the same answer for all of them. I said, the minute you, would, you would take on publicity people, people smell a rat and think you're in trouble. I said, the only publicity that I think is sound is the publicity that the students who've been there give you to the world. And I'm going to trust on that. And I am quite sure that no matter how bad the depression is, there are enough people with money enough to send their students to college if you can provide the top education possible yeah. for them. And it worked. We didn't, we yeah. weren't, uh, we, we weren't. Yes, we worried too much about that. I remember worrying about it at Vassar College. I, I yes. went down to see Mr. Burgess Johnson, who was then running our publicity, yeah. and uh, he said, to me, you, you don't read the right pages in the newspaper. He said, do you know how many times Vassar College appears uh, per month? And I said, no. Well, he said, the average is between six and seven hundred items a month in the take the colleges of the country. So really? they go right along. Total is yeah. somewhere near 10,000. It increases yeah. at the opening yeah. of college and elsewhere, but the average mm -hmm. is it runs up that. And of those, 90% are on the social page. Yeah. So and so from Vassar College, yeah. so, so and so Vassar College is engaged. Yeah. She, so and so Vassar College has chosen a bridesmaid. So and so yeah. Vassar College <laughs> is married. Yeah. So and so is at the hospital. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's the publicity that counts, because if those people have a respectable uh, entourage yeah. in the place where they live, you know, they're <laughs> it's going well, to mean something. I and he, and he, he just put me uh, quietly to sleep over the thing. I never worried after that, after well, I saw that. Well, you know, that for a long time, uh, the publicity, I think Miss Coates did her best to get good publicity, yeah. but they, she, it was twisted a great deal at first, of course, and uh, uh, I, we had to leave, live that down. But then when, uh, uh, then, then there was a time when we didn't have any publicity, because we weren't known at all, but the, uh, funnily enough, the very first publicity that I saw that was unconscious publicity was walking down Fifth Avenue, <laughs> passing a dress shop in the fall that had, uh, this, these are the kind of girls, uh, dresses that girls are going to wear at Vassar, Bryn Mawr, Smith, and Sarah Lawrence. It was the first time I'd seen them casually ma ma uh, mention the colleges existing <laughs> was in that dress shop. But it is, uh, I used to have the girls to tea uh, the freshmen every year, and I would ask them how they happened to come here, and it was invariably through other girls that had been here. Yes. And that is the only kind of publicity that's yes. really sound yes. if you're going to build up a college. I'm uh, sure. I think you, you ought to put into this talk the the fact that from the very beginning, the curriculum you now have was well established. It's been I improved in I say that. But it's there. The, the first place, no rank in the faculty. Yes. Everybody of equal rank, all fellows. Mm -hmm. uh, second, no semesters, uh, no no mid mid-year examinations, no. no examination to to speak of. Uh, uh, grades, 
are not reviewed in percentages. No. People are reported psychologically, educationally, socially, but the rest we, we just leave to providence. And uh, every student has to be invited back yeah. to take. No student has a contract of graduation there, and she knows that and signs it when she comes. She's invited back. They're not expelled. So you, you well, get rid of a lot of, of difficulties of uh, administration and discipline that have cursed the older colleges. I, when I went to Yale, I was unfortunately a member of what was called the Drocken Committee. Yeah. Lovely name, you know. <laughs> so we met every week and dropped somebody all through the year. Drop, drop, drop. Oh, atrocious. I think, the, uh, I think we never can, can forget that although this college has been tremendously concerned with research, we've published, I think, six or seven books now. Oh, yes, and you've done more in the way of studying the growth of the student through college than any, than any other college. Other institution. Yes, I think so too. And uh, uh, the, uh, although that is, is uh, true, uh, there have been very few basic changes. Yes. The things we have done. Uh, have not been mistakes. Now there were no. two little things that Miss Coates started. She she had faculty plan a curriculum for their classes, uh, 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 a plan for the college in de class yeah. in detail at the beginning yeah. of the year. We dropped that, and we dropped this leisure time activity yeah. reporting. Those are the only two little things. Now we've added a number of things yeah. uh, to this whole business, but the one tremendous. Uh, uh, Ad advantage was that gift from the Rockefeller F Foundation early in our career for research, which enabled us to get hold of some awfully good psychologists and to just work and work with them as objectively as we could yes. to find out what really did educate people. Yes. Well, I didn't realize that the life at Sarah Lawrence would be so exciting that all the students would want to have leisure time activities, uh, because at Vassar College we had to force students into it. To, to get out. They, uh, they tend to be inert. Uh, oh, the, so, so. Yes. Uh -huh. and the social life, I think, has changed considerably in that regard in recent yeah. years. Yeah. Are we